What's going on, folks? Thanks for joining me. Welcome to Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton. We're going to be breaking down all of the news, matchups, and happening in the world of kickboxing and Muay Thai. This is a huge week as we have Badr and Buakau both fighting this weekend. We have a K1 show. We have one championship. We have RWS, Raja Damnern Stadium Muay Thai, and we have Glory Kickboxing. We have so many events going on and so many matchups to talk about. Look, I appreciate you being here, but I am going to skip the news of this week as it is a little bit of a slow news week. Um, but let's just get right into the matchups and start talking about some of these marquee fights that we have. Now, there are so many fights this weekend. I'm just going to be covering off a few from each event and kind of tell you, like, what are the main fights that you need to be paying attention to? What are the fights that don't matter this weekend? Uh, there's just so much going on in kickboxing and Muay Thai. Folks, I really do appreciate your time. So the schedule is one fight night 32 from Lumpini Stadium will be on September the 8th. We have Glory 88 on September the 9th. That one's with Badr Hari. RWS Muay Thai with Buakau will be on September the 9th. And then K1 Rebirth and Reboot with the uh, Trilogy title matchup and the Openweight Grand Prix will be on September the 10th. Let's start with one Fight Night 32. Uh, there are some really fun uh, and exciting Muay Thai matchups on this card that I think you need to be paying attention to. The main event, Compat Fairtex versus Kong Chai. Uh, that's going to be a banger. It's going to be such a good fight. You also have the return of one of the greatest kickboxers in history in Sidichai, and he'll be fighting Mohamed Siasanari. Great fight for Sidichai. And I'm, I'm happy to see a guy who wanted to keep busy for his entire career, has an incredible legacy, still keeping active. Uh, I want to say in his old age, but I think he's he's arguing he might be younger than me. Anyway, so we also have Nakarab Fairtex. We'll be fighting Nabil NNA. You know who these guys are. This is going to be an absolutely great fight. Make sure to tune in, and that one's going to be on September the 8th. Uh, it's going to be a really great card to be tuning in for. Let's go into Glory 88, because I think that's the one that a lot of people want to talk about, at least my viewers probably want to talk about the most. Uh, it will be headlined by Badr Hari versus James McSweeney. It will also have the women's super bantamweight title between Tiffany Van Seuss and Sarah Musadak. This will be a rematch from earlier this year. This is also going to be Tiffany Van Seuss's last career fight as she is 34 turning 35 and she says i'm ready to call it a career Badr Hari is a kickboxing legend this guy competed in the golden age of k1 kickboxing he had fought the who's who he has fought the best he has fought everyone from remy bonyaski to semi shell to rico verhoeven he has fought absolutely everyone and uh, i've done some articles on him in the past that's to talk about where he ranks in all time and Badr Hari is always a study on, um, so in books and movies and other things like this, um, we have the concept of do you separate the art from the artist? So for example, Roman Polanski just had a movie come out in the last few weeks. Uh, in the past, people were happy to separate his movies from his personality. Now people aren't so happy to do that. They don't separate the art from the, from the artist. Same with J.K. Rowling. How much do you separate her work from her personality? And Badr Hari seems like a study in that as well. How much do you separate a person's personal life or controversies from the action in the ring? Does that influence how much he ranks in a greatest of all time? And with all of these discussions, when we talk about separating the art from the artist, there isn't a right answer. There isn't a correct answer. It is absolutely up to you on how much something outside the ring really influences someone. Um, Badr Hari came on the scene as a very young man. He was preordained to be one of the all-time greats. His coaches had talked about how amazing this guy was, and he fought like a whirlwind. He fought like a thunderstorm. He was just something else when he got in there. He was so violent and so direct and so aggressive that very quickly, even in his first few, first few matchups in K1, it was clear that this guy was going to be a powerhouse to watch out for. And now over 20 years, he has always been that powerhouse. His more recent career... Uh, over the last few years, since 2016, has put, and again, this is a question of how much does a bad late career affect someone's greatest of all time status, and again, that's completely up to you. He's had a few no contests, he's had a few losses, but he hasn't had a career win since 2015. How much does that affect how you view his greatest of all time? There's not a right answer here. Everyone's greatest of all time is, list is going to look different. Um, and I think the most important thing with the most important factor with Badr Hari is his legacy. He put Moroccan kickboxing on the map. He was the biggest driving force for an, uh, an entire nation. Most of those ticket buyers, most of those young fighters are Moroccan. Even Sarah Musadak, like she would have grown up 
inspired by Badr Hari. Uh, even someone like Tejani Bezdadi, no doubt he grew up watching Badr Hari. The next generation in the sport were all inspired by Badr Hari because of how much he did. So his legacy is, is one of the biggest in sports. Uh, and now he's going to be fighting James McSweeney here at Glory 88. And it puts a lot of things into perspective because James McSweeney, I, th- I believe, is winless in, in Glory Collision, or sorry, in Glory Kickboxing. Um, he's winless also in K1, but had competed in K1. Uh, he, he was an MMA fighter who toured all around. I mean, he was in the UFC for a very short amount of time. He was in KSW. He was in one championship. He was in Cage Rage, not Cage Warrior. He was in Cage Rage, um, which is quite a while ago. So arguably, James McSweeney was in his prime during that 2010, you know, 2008 to 2010. And Badr Hari, you could absolutely argue the same thing. He was in his prime from 2008 to 20 to 2010. So now really put it into perspective that James McSweeney is actually a pretty fair matchup for Badr Hari, as they are in the same point in their career, aren't they? The winner of this fight will move to the next round. Sorry, the winner of this fight will qualify for the big year-end heavyweight Grand Prix that Glory is putting on. And that's quite exciting. But it, again, it's just if Bader does win, what's he going to do in the Grand Prix? It is, you know, the, you use your imagination. Look at his last few fights. Um, look at the wear and tear on his body and the attitude where after his last fight against Alistair Overeem, he said, look, I'm probably calling it. I, I'm probably going to retire. They gave him James McSweeney. He might qualify. Who knows? Honestly, I think Bader Harvey probably gets the win here. I think they know what they're doing with this with this matchmaking. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Badr Hari and Buakau a little bit later on, but let's get to the co-main event. Tiffany Van Soost will retire in this fight, and it's the rematch against Sarah Musadak. They fought last year in a very close fight in which uh, Tiffany Van Soost was able to get the decision win, but didn't win over the audience. She was booed relentlessly during her post-fight speech, which was meant to be a crowning moment of her career. Tiffany Van Soost, of course, is one of the greatest fighters in female kickboxing history. She has important wins over Manazo Kobayashi, Aline Pereira, of course, Anissa Mexen. Uh, Just an incredible legacy that she leaves behind. And she didn't clarify with a win or a loss, so all we can really say is that she will retire in this fight. Sarah Musadak uh, has been on a tear through this division, beating Juliana Costnard and others. She's a dangerous striker, and I think she's looking to get revenge for her loss. And fighting in front of a primarily Moroccan audience or a primarily French audience, she is a French-Moroccan fighter, and I think win or lose, the audience will absolutely be on her side. Uh, it's going to be a fun fight to watch. Uh, the rest of Glory 88 is Dennis Wosik versus Berjan Paposhi, and that is a good fight. Nordin Mehedin versus uh, Abdar Hamain, that is also a good fight at heavyweight. I actually think the best fight on the card, the, the absolute best fight on the card that you need to keep your eye on, is going to be Pascal Torre versus Stefan Latushku. So uh, Pascal Torre, if you don't know his name, he was the last gentleman to fight Artem Vakatov. Artem Vakatov uh, was stripped of his title because he, he was Russian during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so they stripped him of the title. He went and did a fight in Russia against Pascal Torre. And he's going to be fighting Stefan Latushku. Stefan Latushku is a young man. He's 21 years old who has been on a knockout win streak. He's gotten like 10 fights since 2021 and has won all of them via knockout. He is an absolutely awesome guy to watch. Super talented. He also has notable wins over, over named opponents. They're not just like 10 random knockouts over guys like me. He's beaten real fighters. Like he beaten Mahmoud Satari the first round. He beat a bunch of other people, KG. He beat a bunch of other guys. Absolutely awesome to see him compete. He is uh, just a, a great fighter. Honestly, 21 years old. Look at all this power. Look at all this success that he has had. The reason you need to tune in to Glory 88 is because of Stefan Latushko. This guy is a future champion. All right, that fight card is going to be on September 9th, but let's move forward and see what else we have going on this weekend. Uh, we have talked a lot about the future of Badr Hari and putting it into question. 
RWS Muay Thai will be doing a show live from Raja Damnarn Stadium in Bangkok, Thailand, and there's some really marquee fights on this card. There's a few Japanese K1 kickboxing fighters who will be competing on it. You also have one of the top pound-for-pound -pound Muay Thai fighters in Nautica Yoshinari, and I've talked about him in the past and why he's so important as a Ferengi. He is a, a Japanese fighter who is taking over Muay Thai in the marquee divisions where Thais typically rule. He's only 22 years old, and he will be fighting on the RWS Muay Thai card. Uh, he's going to be fighting Solowe, I believe it's pronounced, uh, but we're going to find out a little bit later on. Uh, this RWS Muay Thai card also has the final four in their super welterweight Grand Prix, and then the two winners from this card will fight later this year for three million baht in the finals. So you're going to have uh, unbeaten, pound for pound, top ranked fighter Danny Rodriguez. And he's going to be finishing his trilogy. This is the third fight that he's fought Yadwacha, and they're always exciting. They're always really good fights. Danny Rodriguez is such a talented fighter. He's a Swiss Dominican fighter who extremely competent. He's extremely intelligent. He's extremely technical in a very competitive division. This is at 155 pounds. You also have Petch Morikot, who is a former champion in one championship, and he's going to be fighting Thanon Chai. Thanon Chai, again, he's a top fighter on a hot win streak, one of the most important fighters in the 155 division. And it's just all the final four of this Grand Prix, the super welterweight, they call it, but it's about 155 pounds. Oh, awesome. It's action-packed. It is must-see TV. If you want to see it, it's going to be on DAZN, which is also the home for K1. Uh, so it's a pretty good selling point if RWS Muay Thai and K1 are both on the same platform. If you are not able to watch RWS Muay Thai live from Bangkok, you can catch it on their YouTube channel directly after the broadcast. Other organizations have you wait two weeks, RWS just puts it up right away. Now the main event of this card, we're going to be seeing Buakau Banshamak will be fighting Yasuhiro Kido. Now, Yasuhiro Kido, if you don't know him, he is an important fighter in K1 history. He won the 2008 K1 Max Grand Prix, and he's been fighting for titles ever since. He fought Shingiz Alazov, I believe, in 2017 or 2018. Uh, he's also fought for various titles all over K1, uh, but he is a very skilled and active fighter who is now in his 40s. He said in an interview, if I fought Buakau in his prime, I wouldn't stand a chance. But now Buakau is in his 40s, so I might be able to knock him out. So Yasuhiro Kido is keeping it pretty realistic about what this fight means. Buakau, of course, is one of the biggest legends in kickboxing history. He had a promising career in Muay Thai before his switch to kickboxing. He came on the scene as a relative unknown in the 2004 K1 Max Grand Prix and knocked everyone out of the water. He fought during the golden age of K1 and K1 Max, fought the best of the best, including like... Nikki Holskin, Giorgio Petrosian, John Wayne Parr, uh, John Charles Skarbowski, Masato Kobayashi, uh, who am I forgetting, Andy Sauer, Albert Krauss, just anyone who was relatively important in that weight class, Buakau fought. And he also traveled the world and took matches that he maybe didn't have to, but he was always willing to fight. Like one of the crazy things is that him and Giorgio Petrosian didn't even fight for a K1 title. They just fought. And that's the kind of attitude this guy had. Like, no major gold on the line, no problem. I'll still go out of my way and fight Giorgio Petrosian. Blue Cow is an absolute badass who really, I mean, he's a celebrity in Thailand. The, the royal family used to come out to his matches. The country used to shut down like it was an event whenever he fought. And he still has that draw now. And RWS Muay Thai is trying to bring as many eyes to the sport as they can, so Buakau is a very good person to bring in, and he'll be fighting twice this year. Uh, he's going to have one match coming up here in September, and then another match in December later this year with them. Uh, and then next year he's fighting Manny Pacquiao. Just fun. Why not? I don't know. Oh, and he's also fighting in BKFC against Sanshai. Of course, I couldn't forget that one. That one's a great one coming up as well, so he's going to have a busy little while here. Um, but yesterday I, uh, I got the video sent to me that Buakau didn't, show up to the press conference, and Yasuhiro Kidu did show up to the press conference, and he was in full kabuki makeup. Um, this was based on the Japanese comedian Shimura Ken, and I mean, he came out, he was posing for photos, he was doing all the right poses, uh, he had an open workout ready, he was answering questions, and no one told him that Buakau wasn't going to show up. So they put Buakau up on the screens because he sent in a little video, um, and Kido looked so sad. He looked so heartbroken that this might this is a pretty big moment in his career. Fighting Buakau is still a big moment. And he looked so heartbroken. He put on all the makeup like his comedian. And then Buakau wasn't there. 
<laughs> like, what was the point? <laughs> he just looked so heartbroken. Uh, I'll see the video might be playing next to my head, but it was, it was a rent gut wrenching moment for him. Uh, but yeah, he said he is ready to fight Buakau. He strongly believes he can win. Buakau says like, I'm going to knock this guy out. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a really fun one. Now I want to talk about the nature of Buakau and Badr Hari because in all honesty, I'm a person who has seen uh, SEO numbers. I have seen view numbers on videos. I have seen what searches are really working on things like Instagram and YouTube, what search terms are really working in the sport. And, and Buakau and Badr Hari are both bigger than anyone else. Like Badr Hari gets more clicks than Rico Verhoeven does. Buakau gets more clicks than Rod Tang and Stamp Fairtex do. They have such a massive legacy in the sport that their names still carry so much value. Um, and oddly, both guys are in a very similar spot in their career fighting this weekend that honestly, we could just say it's their last fight um, as their legacy is so secure. Now, Bader might be fighting later. Buakau is fighting later. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying their legacy is secure regardless of what happens this weekend. And now let's extend that out. Let's play with that a little bit and, and, and really feel what that means. Regardless of what happens this weekend, their legacy is secure. So does, the, does their fight this weekend matter? We've created in this sport where people in their 40s can't sit back on their legacy and enjoy it because most of them don't have enough money to really retire. Like kickboxing, MMA, boxing, these are all really tough sports. Even at the very top, these are hard sports. These people aren't taking fights. I mean, they're kind of taking fights because they love it, but they're mainly taking fights because they need the money. I want to see our stars, people who built the kickboxing name for an entire nation, be able to, people who have built the kickboxing name for an entire nation, I want them to be able to sit back and enjoy what they've done without having to fight for money when, they're, when their body would rather not. Both people have suffered major injuries in their career. They've gone through other major problems in their career. Like Buakau, at his height, had no money. He had everything stolen by his manager and, and by his trainers, and because of that, he went and founded his own gym. But what an absolutely sad thing to have happened during a young man's prime. He fought the best of the best. And at the end of that, he was covered in gold and had nothing in his bank account to secure his future. And now we're seeing why he has to take four fights over four months in his 40s. Badr Hari, of course, uh, you know, controversies in and out of the ring here and there. Um, Badr Hari arguably lost his prime years. We talk about 2005 to 2008 being his prime years. He may have actually lost his prime years just because he was suspended for various reasons. Um, so we talk about his prime years being that 2008 kind of range there. Uh, but he was a very young man back then. Um, and as he aged up... So what I would implore you to do, if you are the person who maybe clicked on this video or is watching this video or listening to me because you like Badr Hari or Buakau. They're legends. You're looking them up. They're awesome to watch. Go watch the other stuff this weekend. There are some very important marquee matchups this weekend. We're talking about Badr Hari and Buakau fighting almost within a few hours of each other. They're not the most important fights this weekend. There are some amazing fights in kickboxing going on over the entire weekend. It will be a very, I promise if you watch more kickboxing, if you watch more Muay Thai, you will not regret it. Buakau and Badr Hari inspired a lot of these young people who are now fighting this weekend. Their effects can still be felt in the people who are competing this very weekend. If you want to celebrate their legacy, enjoy their fights and watch the fights that they helped create. Watch the sport that they helped create. Also this weekend is a K1 Rebirth and Reboot. This is a really good fight card coming up. I believe it's on September the 10th because kickboxing might be in a spot right now where it's experiencing a small renaissance because of the match and K1 is really looking to push. So they're still on at Bima TV, but worldwide they are on DAZN. Apparently in Japan, they're also on DAZN. Uh, they've hired a new manager. They've gotten different sponsors in. I mean, things are changing here and there. They're looking to go global. Michael Chavello is back. That is now confirmed, I can officially say. And this K1 Rebirth and Reboot is a callback for what they used to do during the golden era of K1 in that they're doing an eight-man heavyweight Grand Prix in one night. 
eight men from all over the globe who are representing different divisions, different titles, different nations. It is an absolutely awesome concept that I'm happy to see back. So these matchups were just announced, I believe, yesterday. So let's go ahead and break down in a little bit more detail, uh, you know, which one of these men really matter, what to pay attention to, what's going on. Uh, so you can see next to my head the matchups and their records and their heights and everything like that. So Mahmoud Satari, of course, we all know him, born of Iran. He is, was the 2022 Openweight Japanese Grand Prix champion. So let's talk about what that means because, because working in the sport, sometimes things just don't make sense. The company is called K1 World Grand Prix. This guy didn't win a World Grand Prix. He won the K1 Japanese Grand Prix. He himself is not from Japan. So he won... <laughs> So he won a K1 World Grand Prix, Japanese Grand Prix. Makes perfect sense. Makes sense. Other people in the Grand Prix weren't all Japanese as well. But anyway, so he's not even a world champion. He's just a Japanese champion. Uh, he's an Iranian fighter in a Japanese organization. Makes perfect sense. Anyway, he's probably one of the favorites to at least make the final, if not win the entire thing. And he's going to be fighting uh, Italy's Claudio Estrate, who is known as the Grizzly. He is a European kickboxing champion and a two-time Italian kickboxing champion. Of Sina Karamian, also of Iran. He is the hero of Iran, standing at 200 centimeters and 90 pounds. He is the 2018 K1 World Grand Prix champion, uh, and he has also defended his cruiserweight throne twice. He's going to be fighting Karim Jamai of Germany, who is undefeated, coming into a Grand Prix with an unbeaten record. That's absolutely awesome. And he is a ISCA super heavyweight world champion. You also have Mikhail Turnsky versus Ariel Mikado. Mikhail Turnsky is the KOK, King of Kings heavyweight world champion. He's going to be waving the KOK flag as he's going in there. Uh, he has 42 wins in his career, and he's also gotten like Waco titles and stuff like that. He's going to be fighting Ariel Mikado of Brazil, who is a former competitor in glory in the light heavyweight division. He's also captured a light heavyweight title in WGP. Um, so yeah, definitely a dangerous, dangerous fighter. Very experienced, uh, especially at the, the highest levels. Uh, Valentin Bordenau versus will be fighting Lou C. Uh, Valentin Bordenau is a Romanian kickboxer who has earned the Romanian national kickboxing title three times over in his life. Uh, and he's a proper 193 centimeters at 110 kilograms. And he's going to be fighting Lu Si. Lu Si is a uh, Chinese national kickboxing champion. And he also has some experience in Sanda as well. Uh, a good 95 kilograms and 195 centimeters. Let me bring up some of the matchups here. If I were to be making predictions on these. So these are the eight men in the open weight Grand Prix. I'm not going to predict the entire brackets, but what I am going to do, just who wins the first round of fights uh, between Mahmoud Satari and Claudio Estrade, you can probably safely assume it's going to be Mahmoud Satari. Claudio, or sorry, it's going to, <laughs> you can probably assume it's going to be Mahmoud Satari. That is, uh, he's, he's, like I said, the favor, favorite to get to the finals, if not win the entire thing. Though Claudio Estrada brings a ton of knockout power, it just takes one punch for him to, to change the course of a fight. Uh, Sina Karamian uh, versus Kareem Jamai. Yeah, Sina is definitely the favorite to win. Very experienced fighter in K1. Uh, he's fought the best of the best. Very, very highly ranked fighter and highly respected. He likely goes to the next round. Mikhail Turnsky versus Ariel Mercado. Really well-made match. I like that one a lot, but I think Mikhail Turnsky probably goes through to the next round. He's going to have a size advantage in this fight. Uh, Ariel Mercado, a veteran fighter, but I think he's the smallest in the Grand Prix, and that's going to be tough, especially if you're fighting three times in one night. Being the smaller fighter might begin to uh, have an effect. But yeah, Mikhail Turnsky probably gets to the next round. Uh, Valentin Bordeneau versus Lucy. I mean, Lucy, it's tough to find a heavyweight kickboxer from China. Uh, and then they found a... You know, they found someone they could who was a national champion, but he is fairly inexperienced. I believe he has less than 10 fights in his overall career. I'm not sure what his amateur career looked like before that. But yeah, Valentin Bordeneau, more experience, um, certainly one to keep an eye on. So likely those four get to get to move to the next round. You also have Akihiro Kaneko versus Masashi Kimura. Um, <clears throat> And this is a great fight. This is the third time that they're going to meet, and the super bantamweight title will be on the line in this matchup. <clears throat> it's about 55 kilograms. I think that's 122 pounds or so, something where in that range. Um, 
And the first time they met, it was a really great fight, and Masashi Kimura was able to walk away with a victory. He was landing lots of... He mixes high and low really well, so he'll attack body-head, body-body-head, head-head-body, and he has these really great lead hooks that he separates most of his game around. Um, in the second fight versus Akihiro Kaneko, this was in the finals of a one-night tournament, and it seemed like Masashi Kimura's movement was almost gone because that was the third fight that he was fighting that night, and same with Akihiro Kaneko. Uh, Masashi Kimura was having success early, and a few hooks from Kaneko really changed the course of that fight, and it looked really good. Uh, but yeah, Akira Kaneko was able to get a decision win, but this was the 22, 2022 K1 fight of the year, uh, the second time they fought just last year. Now they're going to have their third fight on this card, and it's expected to be another fight of the year type thing. And I think the reason these two really matter is th it's the battle of what's your favorite memes. Um, Masashi Kimura was a guy who fought in jorts and won when he was fighting in jorts. And since he switched to regular athletic shorts, he's had mixed success. And you know, you just, you miss, you miss the jorts. Like what a decision this man made. Uh, and he looked, he looked fine in them. And I think most of the fans are upset that we don't get to see the jorts anymore. I think more fighters should fight in jorts. Could you imagine a Rico Verhoeven in jorts, a Bader Hari in jorts? I mean, what are we doing? Like, what is even the point of the sport if we're not going to watch fight? You know, I'm not, I've had enough rants in for one episode. We'll look forward. Akihiro Kaneko, of course, is known as Big Frog. Uh, no one knows where it really started. He just said Big Frog one day on Twitter, and it was really funny. And now all of us say Big Frog all the time. Um, and to me, that's funny. So it's a battle of the memes, Big Frog or Jorts. But yeah, Akihiro Kaneko versus Masashi Kimura. Really great fight. I mean, if I'm a betting guy, I, I think Masashi Kimura doing better in both fights, uh, won the first fight pretty cleanly. Akira Kaneko, you know, came back in the second fight to really win after both men fought three times. I am leaning Kimura, but yeah, I could be entirely wrong in this fight. I mean, it could go anyway. It's one of those fights like we were talking about last week. These guys could fight five times and you'd get five interesting different results that maybe we didn't see before. You could fight 10 times and every time the fight looks a little bit different. But know that I'm really excited. Remember we were talking about some fights here really do matter? This is one of the fights to tune in for. Akihira Kaneko versus Masashi Kimura. Folks, I hugely appreciate your time. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're talking Buakau and Badr Hari and RWS and Glory and all this other stuff. But thank you for joining me for Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton. I really do appreciate it. If you have any comments or suggestions or even stuff that I got outright wrong, that's okay. If you're talking about the legacy of Buakau and Badr Hari, hey, absolutely. Please do talk about it. Let me know. But I'm going to be back next week at the same time on Wednesday uh, to talk about these matchups that we got this weekend. And I'm really excited to talk about them. I'm really excited for this weekend to see every single fight go down. Thanks so much for your time, folks. We'll talk to you soon.